Welcome everybody to uh, Experimenta. My name is Alexi Gambis. I'm the uh, Artistic Director of Imagine Science Films. And very excited to uh, have our weekly uh, Experimenta on Thursday at 11 a.m. And today we have Matthew Putman, who's a very close friend and, uh, first of all, a very close friend. And then he's also the CEO of Nanotronics Imaging, a uh, board member of Pioneer Works, but he's also a poet. He has a, a blog called Converging Minds. And uh, Matthew, thanks so much for being here today. Oh, God, always a good chance to talk to you, Alexi. Matthew, so today we're going to talk a little bit. I, I wanted to start, uh, you know, so the, the whole kind of mission of Experimenta is to talk about uh, science, but how it intersects with culture, with arts, with society. Um, and I wanted to start a little bit by, uh, by just getting a little brief overview of, uh, of what you do and what nanotronics teaching is, is all about. Right, so... You know, I used to work as a uh, applied physicist, and I worked on on materials that were soft materials, and really I wanted this idea of enabling nanotechnology to occur uh, because I was seeing these amazing things in people's labs. You would go to Columbia and MIT, and you would see these labs that are creating great technologies, but they were incredibly small. And I, when I was working on my PhD dissertation, I, I started to realize why they were incredibly small, uh, because you had to use things like atomic force microscopes, which are hard to tune, or electron microscopes, whereas we all sort of like to use, you know, regular light microscopes. I know you're an enormous microscope buff, um, and so we, you know, this is, you're not the only one. Every scientist would rather use a, a regular light microscope. So if you could use a regular light microscope, look over a very large field, and still see very small objects, and be able to then do one extra step, which is to classify those objects, say what you're looking at, then you have something unique. Uh, and sort of, I, I compare it to saying, if, you know, if generally with microscopy, you have to, you know, if you were looking for a needle in the haystack, you'd actually have to know where the needle is, and you, then you could analyze that needle. Here we can look at the entire haystack and every needle in it. So, so Matthew, just for, for, the, for the audience out there, what exactly is nanotechnology? I feel like the word nano is in every scientific conference that we go to nowadays. We hear about the nano world. We hear about nanotechnology. We, we hear about the nanoscale. What, what exactly is uh, nanotechnology and nanotech, nanotechnology imaging? Yeah, I mean, this, this is something that has so many definitions that everybody stretches to meet their own uh, needs, and it really came out of a, a government initiative to fund it by, in the Clinton administration, which, you know, broadened this definition of nanotechnology to anything under 100 nanometers in size. Um, of course, a nanometer being a billionth of a meter. Um, so where, you know, Eric Drexler and these just sort of really forward-thinking science scientists and engineers were thinking of nanotechnology as being self-replicating uh, robots and, that, and uh, materials that could, you know, act with, you know, in the bloodstream and m much more sophisticated than just things that are small. Uh, because if you actually think about it, of course, anything is nanotechnology on some level. Uh, now, we, we also stretch this, uh, you know, we hope that we become, see smaller and smaller things. So for us, we say the nanoscale is anything under a micron. So anything from zero, nano, you know, one nanometer to a thousand nanometers. That is just because that's you know you know we, we continue to try to move down and see smaller and smaller things. Uh, but these definitions are strange. So Matthew, before we before we talk a little bit about about the kind of the the optics and 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 what is being done at nanotronics imaging. I'm curious, just for the people out there to understand like, how you got interested in the nano world, to talk a little bit about your background, um, because I know it's been, a, it's been a very curvy road with a lot of different uh, interests in the arts and science. And uh, Tell me a little bit how you ended up uh, getting fascinated by the nano world and, and also by the possibilities of, of, you know, of probing into that nano world. Well, I mean, there's part of me that's just really into science fiction and futurism. And when I started reading you know, popular science accounts of this new burgeoning field and everything that could be done on this level, it was an exciting thing that actually fit 
into the field of study that I had uh, worked under, so this was an opportunity to be involved with the future, I thought. Um, I used to have a, a company with my father uh, that my father started, and my parents, both of my parents actually called TechPro, and we made instrumentation that tested rubber and plastics. And rubber and plastics have been filled with particles of different sizes in order to give them reinforcement or special optical qualities. And when I was working in that business, this is the first part of uh, the 2000s, and we, and you know, in late late 20th century also, uh, this we we started to see that you had new properties the smaller your particles get, so you could get things like better conductivity, you could you could make things that had better optical properties, um, things that were stronger. Uh, so I I saw this almost an immediate practical application for it, and then this sci-fi fantasy of creating a, uh, a world where you can do things that aren't being able to be done with traditional materials. And so, uh, okay, so tell me a little bit, so I, I'm curious also to just get a little background about your kind of artistic, um, you know, what, what you've done in kind of the arts, and because you were used to work at TechPro, but you've also been involved in the arts, and um, and if you could talk a little bit about that, because we're going to gear into also about the art of microscopy and, and all that. Um, yeah, that. I mean the art of microscopy, which we'll I, we'll get into. Um, it's it's amazing. Last night we had a, you know a CEO of a large company here, and uh, she said, you know, in our medical division, I I go over there. She she's I says I'm not a technologist, and I go over and I see these things that they're working on it, and I say, wow, that's beautiful, and the scientists don't even. Oh, I guess so. You know that you know in, in our daily lives as scientists, we think of it as something that is quantitative in order to help us reach a scientific goal. Uh, but finding the the beauty in that can actually inspire the science. Uh, my background isn't in the visual arts at all, though. Uh, I, I'm sort of a you know a B minus piano player at best. But uh, what I found I really like to do is play free jazz. So I like to play with people. Um, where we don't have any preconceived idea of what we're going to do. We should just warm up by playing, getting to know each other and the sound, and then end up creating something that seems like it was planned, at least to some degree, um, that that's spontaneously occurs. I do this alone on the piano as well. And I think it's really an analogous to the way I like to do experimentation or brainstorming to come up with ideas. Uh, the, the, the group here, one reason uh, here at Pioneer Works we have a team from uh, Nanotronics and we're all in one small room rather than having separate offices like we do in, like I used to at the old company and a lot of people do. And it's in a way uncomfortable because they have to, they're listening to me talk to you now while they are coding. I mean, this is a frustrating thing. but the, but to have sort of a jazz jam session is something I find really great and that things can come out of that sort of flow state uh, and so, so that it influences the science in that way. So Matt, Matthew, tell me a little bit about what um, what nanotronics imaging does and, and we'll, we'll get into a little bit about the fact that you're now implanted at Pioneer Works which is kind of this uh, contemporary art space in Brooklyn but, but first tell you know for the kind of the lay audience what what exactly does nanotronics imaging do, um, both you know, at, at, at your different kind of uh, your offices in, uh, in Brooklyn, but also in terms of like, supplementing microscopes to different labs around the world? Right. Uh, you know, there, there are two ways to think about this. We, you know, company slogans are kind of corny, but we have one now that actually does describe what we do as a business, which is to build the future, you have to see it. Um, and you know, if you think about a new industrial revolution or taking these new designs um, that that use different smaller architecture, especially in semiconductors, so everything that goes to, into any computer, any phone, uh, you know, they're starting to have to come up with new processes, uh, and they need automated tools in order to be able to, you know, to to make this happen. Uh, so they have to refurbish their the, their process, uh, and right now there is a, a big need for being able to see 
really high resolution images over a very large area and to do this automatically and then to do what we call classification using some type of algorithms in order to identify what you're seeing. Mm -hmm. and this can be used in a, in a factory setting as a quality control tool or it can be used in a design setting where, where a, a researcher is trying to come up with a new architecture for semiconductors. Now of course what we do is completely agnostic to it being semiconductors that those are just the clients we have and it is material science so I get it a little bit better because I'm not a biologist like you. So one reason why you're on our advisory board uh, is not just because you make amazing films and help me out with things but also you can help, help us figure out what are the areas where looking over a large area and identifying things that are smaller um, can be useful where traditional microscopy maybe hasn't uh, succeeded as much as it should. And I think nobody knows microscopes better than you. So, so Matthew, um, yeah, I'm, I'm obsessed with microscopes. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you a little more about it. But what are, what are some of the, so for example, in the medical world or in, in biological applications, what are some of the applications that these nano, you know, nanoscopes have? And are you... Is it possible to do live imaging, or are you actually are you looking at, for example, like living tissue, or is it all fixed? Or how, how are you actually coming into this nanoscale? In right. So I'll give you an idea of just a few of our applications. We get, you know, as a as a business, we have kind of limited bandwidth, and we have to focus on one area, which is why we really focused heavily on semiconductors. However, at the beginning, I, I just wanted to throw out feelers everywhere. Mm -hmm. So we sold one to Columbia Medical School. They are using it for, they, they are working on neurogen, uh, neurogenesis in the hippocampus, which, you know, looking at how toxins, different things can affect it and how that might be linked to Alzheimer's. So they're looking at dendrites, um, which have not been able to be imaged and not classified very easily before. And, you know, people could spend all day looking at a, a neuron and looking at a cell body and then counting these dendritic spines. I don't know if any of your viewers, if everybody knows about this, this way, of course, that... Uh, All of our viewers know about dendritic okay. spines. All right, cool. <laughs> so, yeah, the, the, you know, I actually didn't know about uh, dendritic spine density. I knew dendrites were the way that, neuron, that uh, neurons communicate with each other. But, uh, the, you know, we're able to look at this and see how it, you know, the, this length of the dendrites and the reduction of... Uh, of dendritic cells relates to memory loss, the creation of short-term memory, creation of long-term memory, which goes to this area of the brain. Well, people would be able to look at one slice of the brain before. We're able, and it would take all day, sometimes more than all day, to go and count and all of these neurons. Whereas, you know, we look at 12 slides that have four slices of rat brains, for instance, on them that are dyed, and then we do all the analysis in 15 minutes. Uh, so this is really allows the throughput of the research process. It allows the researchers to, instead of have being crunched over a microscope all day and then trying to figure out what they're seeing, we, we take that load off them so that they can be creative scientists uh, rather than just technicians. So even technicians then can start to be more creative. So that's one area. Another area we have in McGowan Institute, which is the really leading institute for regenerative medicine, and they do uh, regenerative uh, scaffolds of uh, esophagus scaffolds, they even do regenerative fingers, they have a guy who's cut off the finger, they can regrow fingers. Regenerative medicine I think seems really sci-fi if we're talking about, but it's actually been done on patients. And this is a real thing that everybody should know about actually and it's kind of surprising they don't. Uh, so we have some there. So and, and then we do some clinical pathology stuff for some uh, can, uh, cancer pathology that is still being done in a way that it's been done for 70 years. So it's, it's bringing these sort of convergence of a bunch of new technologies together to make this fast and more accurate than the human, a human eye can be so that we can free the humans up to do the more complex thinking and making decisions based on that. And so, so Matthew, what I, what I find also fascinating with nanotronics is that, and this is where we're going we're to get into, is that not only is you know, nanotronics implanted in all these institutions, but also now there's a, you know, a branch of nanotronics that is implanted in this art space in, in Brooklyn um, at Pioneer Works. Um, and I find that completely innovative to have 
you know, kind of this, uh, you know, kind of this advanced kind of like uh, microscopy, you know, um, establishment that kind of incorporates itself into a contemporary art space. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that, about what, uh, how long have you been at, uh, at Pioneer Works, and what exactly is Pioneer Works for people who don't know, and, and how do you collabor collaborate with artists over there? Well, as you know, Alexi, uh, when you were making the Fly Room, if your viewers don't know, there's a new movie that Alexi is a director of. Um, I came to see your set, uh, which was, I think, amazing, re this recreation of uh, a, a lab at Columbia, which is the university I used to work at, but a, a lab that from the 20s, and it looked you know, it's a lab I wanted to work in. You and I had talked, let's, let's just move into this lab. It was <laughs> just live there, live there. For live the there. Yeah, I knew. But, but what I found was it, it took from the first time I walked in the door here at Pioneer Works till the time that I decided this is where I wanted uh, Nanotronics Brooklyn office to be, rather than, you know, we were working out of, of Tribeca. Our main office is in Ohio. They have great people in Ohio. Um, but I, 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 I wanted this presence in New York. And I was so inspired by what they were doing here. Uh, because generally, if you deal with science art collaborations, and of course, you guys at Imagine Science do an excellent job of it. Uh, but oftentimes, you do an excellent job because a movie's made over a long period of time, I think. Mm -hmm. This is something I'm starting to realize, that if you try to make a weekend of science scientists and artists getting together, and trying to have this cross-fertilization of ideas, that can be good. It can start you thinking. But if you're actually embedded day after day with each other, so the best artists in the world and the best scientists that we can find. Um, so, I mean, we really do have some of the most famous artists in the world here. They come in and out of here. Um, and, you know, photographers, musicians, uh, that, they're, that the, the cross-pollination just becomes part of the the atmosphere. It doesn't need to be forced. Mm. Um, so what, what's happened with that is literally we have artists that come in, really good artists, they come in and say we would like to use this microscope mm. and can you just show us the basics and the, we, the, the guys here, um, Angel and Jacob and, and the, uh, anybody that's here, treat, train them on it and they will uh, start doing whatever they want with it, things that I would never think of. And that's what, what, yeah, what I find amazing is, is what, what's, what's great about Pioneer Works is the fact that you have these scientists and these artists that are actually, you know, physically working side by side, right? So you have these artists in residence, you have these scientists in residence. Um, and as, as you were saying also, you know, it's not happening over a weekend where scientists and artists come together and, and kind of discuss, um, but they're actually physically working together and so organically collaboration stem from that. Um, but how, how do, just, just to follow up on what you just said, how do, um, so you have artists that come into to the Nanotronics uh, kind of, you know, sci-fi uh, lab that's, uh, that's on the third floor, um, and how does it happen in the other way? Like, for example, do scientists, are, are you involved at all in kind of the artwork that's happening there? Are there events that kind of bring together the science and the art? Yeah. Uh, how does that dialogue kind of maintain the yeah, it happens in a few ways. So one of the ways, uh, Angel Say, who is, works here with me, for for instance, who's you know sort of a, a, a star new grad of Columbia Engineering, um, you know, will has taken advantage of uh, and and collaborates, helps them a lot on we have, there's a 3D printer, and so we will print new parts and design new parts, sometimes for things that are needed for the art the artists, and then we realize that we can 3D print these parts, but then we also realize, yes, that filter looks good for us, and that's something useful for the imaging we're doing. Um, and, that, and that's a, a, a pure collaboration. Uh, also, we have artists that say, you know, we want to take more frames per second because we want to, we want to see crystal growth, we want to see movement more. Well, our customers may not be asking for that right now. Um, but it's sometimes they'll ask for it the next week, or we sometimes need to be ahead of what we think is necessary. So we actually have created user interfaces uh, based on on uh, suggestions. So those are direct impacts, and you know there are a lot of those. Then there is just 
the inspiration, which is what gets you to work every day and makes you want to come to work. Uh, it's changing the pace at which the, what the expectation of a technology worker is. Whereas they, these guys work incredible amounts of hours, they're fantastic. Um, but we hope that it's also filled with a kind of uh, perspective that you get from art um, and being surrounded by art that you don't get strictly from staring at a computer screen coding all day. So, Matthew, have, have there been instances where artists have actually um, kind of enlightened you about how to how to kind of make some of the the user interface more flexible or kind of yeah. thinking about the technology itself? Have artists actually, you know, helped in terms of advancing kind of the 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 uh, you know, kind of the ideas behind mechanics? For sure. I mean, the, I, I suggested one a little bit here about frame rate, but the idea of speed and us being faster uh, leads to a very early question you had is do, do we look at only fixed items or do we look at living items? Well, the truth is we, we, we pretty much look at fairly fixed items because we don't have the type of frame rate that is necessary to do that. Right. Uh, the, the cameras and the exposure are, are optimized for what we're doing. Now we actually do realize it's possible and you know I, we feel a drive to make this happen for this artist but it's actually really important to what we're doing for nanotronics. Uh, so that, that's an example of something maybe we knew was important but we didn't have any customer pool for it or anything like that. It was just something that we, that is going to make us better, and that directly comes from the artist's feedback. So what, what's amazing with all this is that the whole notion of uh, of application, you know, like applying, you know, applying this technology, uh, you know, for scientific research. But but now it seems like the in in the case with nanotronics that the applications are also encompassing, you know, um, you know, specific ideas that artists may have. So it's not only about kind of Trying to understand what dendritic spines are, but it's also about understanding, for example, what the you know like the process of doing a specific type of, uh, of piece, for example. Um, tell me a little bit about some like specific collaborations with artists at, at Pioneer. Um, I know that you were doing something with uh, with Bruno uh, Levy. Yeah, Bruno um, Levy. Bruno Levy is am amazing. Anybody that's watching this should check out his site, Bruno Levy. Um, he's been in, involved with doing video art and doing these sort of amazing pieces where you paint on the, on the wall electronically and it can alter pieces. And he, and, but he's, he has been interested in microscopy for a long time and had worked with microscopes, but he didn't have the possibility to do the scanning that we do. So he would look, you know, like if you have a stage generally, I don't know what kind of microscope you have at home. I know you have one. I, probably a pretty good one, but an automatic uh, uh, XYZ stage so that you can scan across an area, take a lot of high resolution images and put them together into one map um, allows you to, to see more and then to zoom in and so, so he gets an idea of, you know, he, he can take the perspective on something, you know, we had, by the way, if people go to microzeum.com mm -hmm. Um, it's there's some images of both Bruno's work there, um, things he's done, and also things some other artists have done, and some just people who have come into the lab who have ideas. Um, and we'll, put, we'll put all these links up online afterwards for, for people that are interested in looking at um, But they should check that out. I mean, it's really so. Bruno's work is one thing. Um, I'm working with uh, one of uh, one of my. Uh, some favorite artists, one of my favorite living artists is Ernesto Caivano. Uh, you know Ernesto, I think. Yeah. Um, and I've become really good friends with Ernesto. And it's we are we are working on ways to look at nature in a different way and to give us a different perspective. Because like like me, uh, you know, trying to make sense of a scale, um, you know. You know we're tiny in the universe, but we're enormous compared to a virus. And you know, so, you know, how how does that you know what does that scale mean? Uh, how can we make sense of it? Uh, and he's incredibly interested in science and is not a scientist, so he's sort of encouraging. He, he would call himself an amateur scientist, who I think can make great discoveries as amateur scientists always have. 
but he's encouraging me to consider myself an amateur artist, and yeah. I, that's cool because you know it's it's allowing us both the freedom uh, to to experiment. So those are two two examples of things that are, are going on, and then there's some others in the works that I that are even more ambitious, but uh, we'll see how how it all goes. So, um, so Matthew, how long have you been at Pioneer, and, and tell us a little bit about what's uh, you know what are the future plans of, of nanotronics? At, um, you know, not only at Pioneer, but in general, what are, what what's you know, what is the what is kind of the the 2014 looking like for nanotronics? Yeah, so. We are lucky enough we just finished a fundraising round, which is the most boring thing to talk about on an art and science thing, but for some reason in the technology community, raising money is more interesting than actually doing something. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a very funny thing, but I've noticed that, you know, people will write a story about that, and, and, and won't, you know, I could, you know, travel faster than the speed of light, and it may not get a story. <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> but you raise a few million dollars and you get a story written about. But so, but it does enable us to to to, to be able to try things that we haven't before. So for that means bringing in very little of what we do is me. Um, we have such, uh, you know, we're so reliant. I'm so reliant on people that know what they're doing, programmers and uh, technical people. So it allows us to build a, a staff of, I think, really a, you know, A-level people, um, and it, and in a sort of direct way, it it allows us to be able to service customers. Uh, you know, sometimes if we have a, a, a large company that agrees to buy our instruments, we need to have a person there all the time because they run these things 24 hours a day. We we need to be there to support them, and that that took some money. To be able to do so, there's that practical side of it. The more exciting side of it is it lets us not just be in survival mode, but be able to explore really new ideas. We're working with gesture control, for instance, so that you don't have to touch the microscope. And so we're doing uh, things that I think you know it, where we're exploring. So like a very tiny, tiny version of what Google X would do. You know. Uh, and, and so we're nano X, I guess. Uh, but you know, while 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 we're doing our normal survival part of the business, we we're trying to explore new ideas too. And um, that a lot of that will happen here at Pioneer Works for the obvious reasons that we're talking about the cross pollination and also some of the, the people that would that Brooklyn is kind of a interesting scene now of of uh, for for technologists and artists. Uh, but also. Um, there's a really good opportunity, I think, for for the people in Ohio who where businesses like this don't generally exist, or there's not many of them anymore in the region of Ohio where our office is, uh, to be able to be on the cutting edge. Uh, so you know, scaling up, trying new things, and leaving our minds open to where we'll go in the future. And Matthew, talking about kind of the the art science. Uh you know, kind of interface and, and what can happen around there. Um, we're actually going to be doing something, you know, we're, we've been in discussion uh, between Imagine Science and Nanotronics about, uh, well, my, microscopy has always been something that, that just, uh, you know, the public has been fascinated by. Whenever you post a video, a microscopy video online, everybody goes crazy. Is that true? I mean, it, it is kind of true. I mean, when you see that... I, I remember going online and seeing like the heart, the heart beating of a zebra fish, and it had like a. Million oh yeah, that's amazing. Um, but I, I we, you know, we've been exploring new ways of, of doing hangouts and um, and also sharing with people, you know, microscopy, but also using microscopy as a as a stepping ground to to generating discussions between artists and scientists. And uh, so we're going to try to do kind of this new type of hangout. Um, where we're going to have live microscopy, and we're going to talk a little bit about what the microscopy is about, and maybe start these like virtual discussions between artists and scientists. And uh, do you want to talk a little bit about it from from your perspective? Um, yeah. we're, we're very excited about it. We, we would love to. I, I'm not sure how this will work technologically. This will be for yeah. you you to figure out, I guess. Here we're yes. supposed to be the tech company, and you're supposed to be the science, a movie uh, company. But uh, we'll, we'll make the move. We'll make the images move. Right. <laughs> we'll ensure that they'll be moving. <laughs> but you know, as much as we say, you know, this is, this is an open environment for people to come in. Of course, there's one 
<laughs> microscope here at the moment, and even if we had several, we're in one small place in the world. We would love for others to have the experience of using top-end things and to see the things they would like to see um, and to, to be a part of the process. And hopefully together we can figure out a way to have this be interactive in a sense of what you know, doing things that and looking at things that people would have always wanted to look at but don't have the opportunity to. Um, and what's fascinating also is that at that level, at that nano scale, things become so abstract, and uh, and there's there's so many discussions that the images and the and the moving images can lead into because you know it's surround. I remember coming to Pioneer at, at Nanotronics, and it was you were showing me was it Saran Wrap? I think it was Saran Wrap, right? Yes. But it just becomes this like otherworldly, um, you know, kind of lunar uh, space when you see it at that scale. And, and I think it could be really interesting to just talk not only about the technology and the, the science behind it, but also about the artistic value to it. Oh, it's, it's so true. I, you know, um, Ernesto, the same artist, sent me um, some images of snowflakes during the snowstorm the other day. And it was, he would send it a really close up so you could see individual snowflakes and, and you could see these crystals, and then he sort of had it, uh, you know, le less folks that looked like stars. It looked like a starry night, and you know, it, it gives you a really different perspective on nature and reality, uh, and, and that that certainly leads to creativity. I think it's a very poetic thing. So you, you're really into microscopes, right? I mean, I, I'm obsessed with microscopes. I, mean, I, I also think that. Um, but I, I would also be a proponent to say that you know uh, live microscopy and and actually videos of microscopy should be considered a, a kind of kind of a subcategory of film. That that's my uh, my push is that we, we often talk about documentary or fiction or 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 experimental. But I would I would think that you know microscopy and, and just um, these raw videos of things should be almost considered as as art pieces and uh, should be included in film festivals included in in, uh, in uh, art programs, and, and I think it would be, you know, that's kind of the push that Imagine Science is trying to go into. Yeah, I mean, I see the stuff that you guys have done, and the, the, the way you think about it, I mean, you as a biologist, uh, I don't know, I mean, tell me, if you, you, you worked on Drosophila a lot. On, on fruit flies, yeah. So, oh, yeah. You were, how, I mean, how many hours you must have spent on a microscope? At yeah. What? Yeah, I, w I would spend, you know, I would spend quite a bit of time under the microscope and look looking through the microscope. And I, and it, what was amazing is that it was oftentimes not the scientifically coherent uh, imaging, you know, that was the most appealing to me. It was often like the artifact or, or something that was discarded on the slide that sometimes would just like completely mesmerize me. And um, and I started thinking at that moment about. You know that it doesn't necessarily have to be results. It doesn't have to be data. You know, sometimes just the the pure, you know, the pure kind of um, artistic value to it is something that people should uh, should be should see. And it often sits in these computers and in science labs and never gets seen by anybody. And I think you know we're trying to get labs to to give us videos and, and have, you know, kind of create a bank of, of videos, of microscopy videos that, that the world can see and can appreciate, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think about this with discovery. I mean, you know, that it can lead you down a path of a thought experiment of what's going on, and it could actually circle back on you, Alexi, and maybe you actually do make a, a large contribution in biology in the end. I mean, people people often say to me because I I talked you know I talked to one of your former um, professors actually somebody very important at Rockefeller who said that you were you know an incredibly promising academic that you could have had this really great career as a as a biologist uh, and then you went to film school I mean it's just like you leave to go to film school and. I'm, there were certain people in the scientific community that thought they were losing someone, right? So we, we feel like th the way that I used to feel if I had a student, at, uh, one of my students go and work on Wall Street, like if I feel depressed by that because, God, oh God they're working on Wall Street, they yeah. could be doing science and engineering. But I know... Filmmaking is not, is not, a, is not as... Uh... 
Right, you're, you're, you're as Wall Street. But. <laughs> it's not evil at all, and I think. See, yeah. I think that I, I didn't see that because I I saw that there, no matter how good you were in science, that's that's always going to be a part of you, and mm -hmm. you're going to and your artistic creations are influenced by your scientific past, right. and that's opening it up to a much larger audience than would read a peer-reviewed journal that you might contribute to. And who knows what discoveries you might actually make, even if they are artistic in nature, that might have some eventual uh, you know, falsifiability to it. But so I, I think it was, I think it's wonderful, and I don't think there are many people in the world that can do that. Uh, well, you know, I, I always think that, yeah, I mean, especially being in a laboratory environment, I think it's, it's you know, one of the frustrating things for me, I, I don't know how it was for you, Matthew, but it was... Um, the fact that it, it felt very isolated, um, yeah. it felt very enclosed, and especially the, the the whole kind of contradiction of being like in New York City, yeah. uh, but also being you know being away from my family, being in New York City, but being isolated in a laboratory, um, but being mesmerized by what I did, and yet you know my friends not understanding why I would spend you know. Uh, Ten hours a day looking at flies under the microscope. Um, I think the the need to go into the arts and filmmaking was also a way of just just, just communicating, just being able to tell people, you know, maybe I can tell you in words what I do, but I'm going to just show it to you in images. I'm going to make movies, and I'm going to, you know, it's, it was almost like a cry of like uh, of like desperation, like trying to reach out and have people understand, you know, and that's why you know having nanotronics at Pioneer, I think, is great because it's breaking the, the concept of a laboratory or, or, you know, and kind of embedding it into an artistic uh, setting. And, and that's what, you know, that's what science needs. Um, it's a different, it's certainly completely different than an academic environment. I like what you say that you get, you're in New York City, but you're not. You're, you're, yeah. you're, having, you're in a, a very uh, specific lab environment that is, that has nothing to do with the outside world, of course it does in some sense because you're looking at what are the building blocks of nature. But uh, I, you know, that's why you know I, I often want to put a note on the door and say, "No, we're working. Don't come in." When you know, uh, people will come by. Dustin Yellen, who started the space and has been so great to be around, will come in with you know really interesting people from different fields. Um, you know, curators. You know, and we always say, of course, come on in, even if it interrupts our business a little bit, because we never know what grain of that out of that world that we didn't know before will be will will somehow grow into something of use to us and of use to the world. So, uh, you know, yeah, I, I, I really get your point, Alexi. That's, yeah, that's no, this is a and and this is a discussion that I want to I want to continue having, um, you know, um, via via our blog and also our spotlight videos, but. The whole concept of like taking the scientific structure and research and, and, and kind of changing it, you know, it's happening with with DIY labs like GenSpace, and, and there's a lot of people that are doing this. But as as you were saying, you know, science and art, you know, it's not just combining those two, you know, over a weekend. It's finding, you know, being very, you know, very strategic about how you do those things and how you combine those things, and and not just saying, oh, I'm gonna, you know, I'm just gonna make images for the beauty of it, but, but finding ways of collaborating, really collaborating, where there's actually um, an output in the scientific, you know, a scientific output, but also an artistic output. Um, but Matthew, I think we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna leave it there, but we're, what we're going to do is we're going to share a bunch of links, um, uh, not only of Pioneer Works, but also of Nanotronics. And we have a spot, we're going to do a spotlight video. We're going to come to the, to the labs of Pioneer with an imagined scientist to, uh, to just get a glimpse of what's happening over there. Um, but, you know, I should also mention uh, that, that you're also part of the Imagine Science team. You're one of our uh, art artists and residents of, of past years, and you've been a big contributor to everything we've been doing. So, uh, so thank you. Thank you so much for that. Well. Thank you for involving me in everything. It's been great. Uh, but, Matthew, uh, we look forward to hearing more. And anytime you have news about what's happening at Pioneer, Shared with Imagine Science, and uh, we're actually hoping, you know, 
a discussion to have with Pioneer, but maybe we'll do some of the film festival. Yeah, we should some training here. We can do everything. You've done an exhibit here, uh, so yeah, I think. Be yeah, fun. we'll definitely have a screening of the fly room and all that. So, uh, well, anyways, say hi to everybody at Pioneer and uh, Pioneer team. Thank you so much, Matthew. I think you're traveling to tonight to go to a hackathon uh, uh, session. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, Santa Monica, California. You know, it's yeah. I'll have to suffer, but yeah, I feel, I feel very bad for you. Right now. I feel very bad. But but thank you, Matthew, and uh, and uh, stay in touch. And thank, thank you. you. Thank you.